In fact, I'm going to start now because it's seven o'clock. So welcome everyone. And uh, we're going to stop promptly on at start start promptly at seven o'clock. Go Dan's going to go to seven fifty, and then we'll open up for questions, uh, answers, and comments, and then end at eight o'clock. So take it away, Dan. Okay. So let's do this thing. So wow. So I am. Um, I've been preparing for this, and the preparation actually was kind of weird because. Um, it's actually more of a challenge to figure out what not to include than it is to understand uh, what things to address. I mean, there's so much in, in these topics. And so you're looking at, you know, I'm looking at all these things. And I'm like, well, OK, that's a rabbit trail. That's a rabbit trail or maybe not this week with that. And so I believe I've condensed this week down into something that's manageable. But what I want to do is get to kind of the keys. We're looking at the return of Jesus Christ, the, the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. And we really want to hit the, the key uh, points and, and get, right to, uh, get right to it. And in fact, kind of what I want to more say is that I want to uh, really answer the question, uh, you know, it, what is the timing? What is the timeline of the return of Jesus Christ? That's really the question that I'm trying to answer. And that question has been, you know, uh, bounced around the room for generations. But the Bible really does give answers to the timeline for Jesus' return. Now, I would never claim and I would never say that I know the day or the hour or even the month or the year. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. But we are accountable to note the season. In fact, let me just share something quick before we get started in Matthew uh, 24, which is the chapter that we're in. And just read this in Matthew, uh, Matthew 24, verse 32. Jesus says, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender, it puts forth its leaves. You know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, all the things we're about to read, recognize that he is near right at the door. You are to recognize this. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. There's a mystery there. Heaven and earth will, will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Then it says famously in verse 36, but of that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son of the nor the son, but the father alone. So we may not know the day or the hour, but we are accountable to know the season, just as we talked about last week with the Pharisees and the Sadducees testing Jesus and saying, show us a sign. And he says, wow, you say that you see a red sky at night and you say, well, you know, it'll be stormy tomorrow or you see a red sky in the morning. Well, it'll be fair weather today. How is it that you know how to ascertain the signs of the sky, but you do not know the signs of the times? Then later he rebuked them, saying that their city would be destroyed, not one stone left standing upon another, because they did not recognize the day of their visitation. And this was to a Bible-knowledgeable crowd. So it is important that we recognize that though we don't know the day or hour, we are accountable to know the season, to be ready, to be watching, and to be waiting. And also, as Matthew 25 says, uh, just like the, you know, the parable with the, um, the, the three men with the talents, we're accountable for what we do with what God gave us in these last days and these end times and with our lives, really. But what are we going to do with this now that we know we're in that season? So I don't want to get too off on that. Let's get into Matthew chapter 24, because I believe that Matthew chapter 24 holds the key to chronological timing of the end times. Now, not everything and every topic from Revelation and Daniel and Zechariah and everywhere else in the Bible talking about the end times in the last days can fit into the timeline of Matthew 24. But Matthew 24 is a great outline for timing, and I'm going to share with you why. And let me pop that up here. Went ahead and did another... Um, a little, let me get this reduce. I'll be right. Okay, can I do that? Okay, I can do that. I'm working on this, guys. Sorry, bear with me. Uh, 
Okay, come on, slideshow. Okay, I got it. I should have had that up. I apologize. Um, and we are still recording. And uh, share screen. Here it is. No further ado. Pop out of the way. All right. So Matthew 24. Now, remember last week we had talked about that one of the things we do is in looking at scripture is we analyze the weight of scripture. Do we find the scripture in more places than one? And this just happens to be something that as I share Matthew 24, we could also share this same material from Mark 13 or Luke 21, which Jesus is giving the same dis dissertation in those two um, in those two uh, gospels. So uh, instead, what, the reason we aren't looking at Mark 13 or Luke 21 is because Matthew 24 specifically gives timing words, words that show timing, words that show chronology. And I want to share that with you. But I also want to share this, that Matthew 24 begins ironically with the disciples being in the same place as many Christians are today when they ask, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age, right? So let me open up by beginning Matthew 24 and looking at this, because it's the question we're all asking. And how, and let's just look at this, because this is where they were at, too. It says this in Matthew 24, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. Now, in Mark 13 and Luke 21, they give other dissertations too. They, they look at the great stones, the great buildings, the votive gifts. You know, they were really going on about all this. The reason was, honestly, because Jesus came into the city just a few days earlier, riding on a donkey. People were praising him and lauding him. He came into the city. He defeated all the Pharisees, Sadducees, lawyers, and scribes with all of his wisdom and understanding and knowledge till they had not a word left to say. So the disciples believed that when they had heard that when the Messiah would come, he would set up his kingdom. And as we know, so many of the theologians in their day, in fact, almost all of them, did not understand that he would come. He would be killed and crucified for our sins, and his blood would be the redemption for, you know, would be the covering for our sins. And he would rise again so that we might rise also with him. As uh, we died to sin and came alive in Christ, and then when we all die from this earth, we end up with him, right? We, they didn't understand that what that was going to happen. They felt that he was coming to save them and that this was it. He was coming to set up his kingdom. It was time to get his scepter and his crown and his robe and his turban because he was going to be the priest and king of Israel, and they were going to be on his left and right hand side of his throne. So they were pointing out everything they were about to obtain. It's the only thing that makes sense here, right? They're pointing out all the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. He was prophesying the destruction of their city. And of course, we had read before that he prophesied that the stones would be torn down because they did not recognize the day of their visitation. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, so now he's at the Mount of Olives. He was just coming out of the temple building. So about a 45-minute walk down the mountain and up onto the Mount of Olives where he would have been sitting. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, so nobody could hear him, saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Three questions. And so Jesus answers them exactly. That's why this is such an important piece of scripture, because it tells us in chronology the order of events. So let me click over to this. And let's look at the chronology in Matthew 24. So I'm going to read this and go through it. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. He begins by saying that. See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ. In this case, Christ is not his last name, for those that don't know. Uh, uh, Christ means anointed one. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the anointed one, or I am the Christ. And they will mislead many. And we've seen many false Christs, haven't we? Many false religions rise up. 
and there will be many more. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not right, frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Yeah, we've seen wars and rumors of wars for generations, but there's specific kind, and we're about to see that. For nation will rise against nation. Okay, we've seen that in the past. But kingdom against kingdom. Okay, that's different. Kingdoms are many joint nations under one ideology, such as communism or fascism or, you know, you, you name it. There are kingdoms that, that aren't just nations. It's whole uh, groupings of nations or peoples that are un, under one ideology. And that's a little bit different. There will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. That's just the beginning, he says. And so we're to be watching, as, as we know, as he says in here, we should know that when we see the fig trees beginning to come out on the tree, we know that summer is near. So this was the beginning. And of course, in my mind, really where we were beginning to see uh, wars that affected the whole world, as we were seeing wars like World War I, uh, World War II, you know, wars that affect the whole world. And these kinds of wars were much different, where we'd see kingdoms rising up against kingdoms and not just nations against nations, much bigger wars. In fact, many people believe that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. We're going to learn next week, not this week, why that would have been impossible and it couldn't fit in the timeline, because we're really going to go after a timeline and nail some things down. Now, like I said, nobody knows the day or the hour, but we're, we will know the season when this is done. So then I follow this down and, and just follow with me. You can see the verses lined up and see this chronology in verse nine. He, and he's using these words. And I really want to pick these words because they're telling you chronology. Verse nine, then, then they will deliver you to tribulation. Many nations already know that China, Russia, some other nations are already in tribulation. Ours is coming and you better believe it is. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Now, many will say, well, this is exclusive to Israel. I don't know many nations that hate Israel because of Jesus's name. Just a thought. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and will hate one another. Okay, at that time. At that time, see that? And so he's, he's putting that into the same timeline as the tribulation. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. We know in Timothy, we see what it looks like at the people at the end of the age. It describes them and it describes them very accurately. Verse 13. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now that endures to the end, the end of what? We will define that before this is all over. We won't define that today, but hang on to that because we are going to define that. He who endures to the end will be saved. This gospel, and this is the goal. This is why we are here right now. This is why we are on earth. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then, then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Okay, this verse 15, the abomination of desolation, as written in the book of Daniel, we're going to go into that a little bit today because that is the linchpin in Matthew 24. That's a dividing line, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, there's, a, there's doctrines out there, and you'll hear doctrines or teaching where they will say, well, you know, we believe in the, you know, you know, that we're going to be taken up during the tribulation, but not the great tribulation. God wouldn't let us be in the great tribulation or this, but they separate the end times by tribulation and great tribulation. And some people say, well, where do we get that from? Well, we actually get that from right here. And that's where this teaching came from is when it says in verse nine, 
then they will deliver you to tribulation. And then everything that's following after that is a part of what we understand is the tribulation period. Then this Daniel event, the abomination of desolation, divides us. Listen to this. Verse 16, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. That's why many people think that this is only Israel, because this is instruction to Judea. However, the people are in Judea what are going to be the ones that will physically see this event happen. And then there's so much on this. Oh, so much. I got to be careful. There is so much on this in scripture to go and grab things that I've never heard actually many people talk about that are mysteries to be revealed. I love this. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in winter or on Sabbath. Right? They still, actually the Sabbath in Israel now, it, things shut down for the Sabbath. And they still, it's one of the religious observances they keep, though many have no relationship or love for God. They just, they do it as a nation. Okay, so that description is all about the abomination of desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel. So after verse 20, we start 21, and here's the great tribulation part. For then, for then, right, in verse 21. Oh, and let me go on to the next slide here. <laughs> when you see right? Then those who are in Judea, Judea, for then, verse 21, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world, since the beginning of the world. So this tribulation affects the world. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days would be cut short. What days? The days of the great tribulation. Okay. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Remember, the false prophet causes even fire to come from the sky, right, to deceive the people. Then Jesus says this to them, and he's saying it to us. Verse 25, behold, I have told you in advance. I'm telling you these things. And he's told them in chronological order. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. Right? During this tribulation, great tribulation period, it sounds like there's going to be many people that are saying, well, Jesus is over here. He's over here. Let's go out. He's over here. He's come back, but he's in this other place. Don't listen to them. Why? Because he says this, verse 27. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. You're all going to see this when it happens. Nobody's going to miss it, right? Everyone will see it when he returns. He's not in an inner room somewhere. He's not out in the woods. He's not out in somebody's house or doing a conference at, you know, some conference center. You will see him. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. And I don't want to get all into that, but that's about the supper of the Lord, right? He comes back and the nations around the city that made war with Jerusalem are, are slaughtered by the king when he returns. And that's a whole other subject. I don't want to take off there. Here's another statement. Um, verse uh, 29. But immediately, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky. And there's a mystery hidden in there. We won't go into that one today. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then, and then, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then 
all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why will they mourn? Well, they've just beheaded millions of Christians. They've just, uh, you know, had a massive persecution of these people they said were crazy, right? And they see the sign of the Son of Man in the sky. And apparently these Christians had been doing their job and preaching the gospel to the whole world. So knowing that the end would come when the last person had been reached, right? Which tells you something else. Some people will say, oh, there's this other time when, you know, people are going to be given a chance to be born again. And, you know, I'm not sure where these doctrines come from, but it says here that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come, right? We know that that's going to happen. So it sounds like they did that because they will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory, because they know he's not coming for them. That's That would be a horrible place. And he will send, and this is included under, and then this, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, right? And the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. So I'm only going to go that far in Matthew 24 this week, because from Matthew 32 on, there's mysteries that, I'm yeah, we only got an hour here tonight, not even that long. That would take a while. So let's jump into this and look at a few things. First, like I said, to, I want to look at that linchpin, that thing in the middle that divides the tribulation from the great tribulation, this abomination of desolation. People are like, well, what even is that? And then they're like, where is that in Daniel? And what does Daniel say about it? So I want to look at it a little, a minute, because actually that event surround that a lot of the end times are actually um surrounding this event and when you know what it is then you see it in scripture so let's take a look at it so i've written here also known as the abomination that makes desolate so what does that mean and where is it found okay so first of all what does it mean the abomination that makes desolate i'll, I'll go down to where i wrote examples here and that will help so the abomination is when the temple is defiled in Jerusalem, when the temple is defiled and they uh, use the temple to, you know, worship false gods and, you know, they, they offer abominable sacrifices on the altar. Basically, they are throwing, uh, you know, they're slapping God in the face. And when they do this pattern, and it's usually a leader of a nation that does this pattern, when they do it, then it makes the land of Israel desolate. And usually the reason that that leader was able to use the temple to do what he was doing is that leader was usually a part of a judgment on Israel because Israel became wicked. They turned against God. They wouldn't listen to his prophets. They ignored warnings. And finally, the enemy armies came in and they... Uh, took the people captive or destroyed the nation or whatever they did, but it made Israel desolate. One example is Daniel 5, which is called Belteshazzar's Feast, where it was actually the king's son was giving a feast, and they took out all of the temple um, uh, vessels, the goblets and the glasses and the bowls and all the finery that was in the temple when uh, Babylon took the Jews into exile the first time when the first temple was in Israel. They took everything from the temple and then they destroyed that temple. And the land was left desolate for 70 years. But before that happened, right, they had, uh, they had come and destroyed the temple and destroyed, uh, you know, Israel took them away. And that defiling, that what happened at that time caused Israel, and Israel's own sin was the reason, but the enemy nation was used to come in and, and take Israel into captivity, and the land was desolate for 70 years, but this was an interesting one because it wasn't done like other abominable, uh, abominations. They hadn't performed any abominable abomination up on the Temple Mount, 
until Belteshazzar's feast. This kid, for some reason, decides to go and get out all the temple vessels and finery and have a party with it in the name of probably their pagan gods. And that's when famously the hand of God wrote on the wall, many, many Tekel Perez, Daniel interpreted it. And that day, that day, Babylon was destroyed and Persia took over. So the abomination that makes desolate is like a curse that lands on people that defile the temple and defile God's house. Uh, Daniel 1131 was the defiling of Antiochus Epiphanes when Greece came in and they defiled the temple and they put, uh, you know, abominable sacrifices on the altar and put false and pagan gods and turned part of Israel Hellenistic, you know, that followed the, the gods of the Greeks. And it was a horrible thing. And but. Judas Maccabeus came in and uh, fought, and they, we famously have Hanukkah because they fought. They overtook the Greeks, pushed them back. There was a small contingent of Greeks left, but Israel had them out back, and they purified and cleansed the temple, and the temple was made ready to worship again, and things had been made right. Coincidentally, that happened on December 25th when it happened, and it's called the Festival of Lights. Jesus wasn't born in December, folks, just letting you know. <laughs> okay, blow a few minds with that. And then Daniel chapter 12, 11, which separates from that, which is the Antichrist. And I want to read that one because some people get confused. They believe, for some reason, that when the temple was destroyed, as prophesied by Jesus, right here in Matthew 24, when he said that not one stone would be left upon another, that happened exactly, you've got it, 70 years later. Notice the 70s, 70 years of the Jews being taken into captivity into Babylon and eventually Persia and then returned back to their land in 70 years. And Daniel actually read the prophecies given by Jeremiah, who was thought of as a freak, not a prophet, by Israel up until that time, right? Daniel knew what he was, and it was 70 years exactly. Here's another 70, right? In which, uh, in 70 years after Jesus prophesied this, it was Titus acting on behalf of his father Vespasian that came down through uh, Israel, destroying cities, and eventually sacked Jerusalem in a bloody, bloody, horrible war. The Jews really fought. But after that war, when the temple was destroyed, not one stone left upon another, the walls were lined with gold, so they tore down all the stones so they can melt the gold out and get all the gold. Therefore, it was a thorough teardown. When they did that, Israel was left desolate until they returned, like nearly 2,000 years later, right? So that's a big desolation, an abomination that makes desolate. I want to read that one in Daniel 12. And just look at it quick. You don't have to turn if you don't want to, uh, if you're not a fast turner, and you can turn later. These are all recorded. And uh, But let's take a look at this. Um, he says, I'll start in verse 10, Matthew. Many will be purged and purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 100 or 1,290 days. How blessed is the one who keeps waiting and attains the 1,335 days. But as for you, Daniel, go your way to the end, then you will enter into your rest. And I'm going to read this part because it has everything to do with some things that we're going to read in the next few weeks. This thing of Daniel is actually pretty key. To answering some questions. But as for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into your rest. Lucky he didn't. He did. He said enter into your rest because a lot of people today would say, oh, well, it said go your way to the end. So somewhere out there, Daniel's still alive because the end means the end, you know. But go to the end and enter into your rest. He's going to die and rise again for your allotted a portion at the end of the Asian at the end of the age, right? The dead in Christ will rise first, all right? That's where we're seeing that. So we see that there is an abomination of desolation that will take place by the Antichrist. And you can go and read uh, all of Daniel 12, and actually Daniel 11 and 12 help because you'll see the Antiochus Epiphanes account, and you'll see it, how it separates itself from the Daniel 12, that they're two different events. 
But uh, so let's read the week. Where do we get this abomination of desolation as spoken of by the prophet Daniel? So we get this week. The week is seven years. It's in Daniel 9. So let's go to Daniel 9. It's right here with this. And I'm going to read um, from 24 to 27. So this week that it's talking about, in these four verses, we're going to go through many different generations and times. And that's why uh, Matthew 24 is so nice in its chronology. But when you read some of these books like Daniel and Revelation, you really have to understand what he's talking about, what age is he talking about? Even inside of one verse, sometimes you'll skip five, six hundred years. So let's look at this. Verse 24 in Daniel 9. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people. There's a 70 again. Have been decreed for you and your people and your, and your holy city to finish the transgression to make an end to sin. Okay, Daniel was living in Babylon and Persia when the 70... Uh, 70 weeks, this was 70 years, right, that they were in captivity. I know it's weird. Some people are like, why does it say weeks and not years? It's a measure, a prophetic measurement. 70 weeks have been given, have been decreed for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and to discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and build, rebuild Jerusalem, and that was by Cyrus, King Cyrus of the Persians, because Daniel brought this up to him, until Messiah, until Jesus comes, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress, right? Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city. Okay, that's confusing to some folks because it says, then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. That's because he was crucified and yes though resurrected he did not establish an earthly kingdom he didn't establish it he did establish an earthly kingdom among believers and as he said right the prayer that he gave us our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth it is as it is in heaven as just as john the baptist said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And for every Christian and every believer, we are a temple. And where we are, the kingdom of heaven has come. That's supposed to be the way that it is. So he established his kingdom through his church, but not an earthly kingdom with a throne or a pulpit or, you know, a Congress or a Senate or any of that. So then the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city. This is Rome. And the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war and desolation. War desolations are determined. So the city would be destroyed. So some people will say, well, this is got to be. Then what we're about to read in verse 27 has got to be that time with the Romans. That And man, let's see the order I want to do this. Because, oh, it's so good. It's so good. But let, let's just follow this out. He did not, okay, uh, Titus, the general of the Romans, did not make a covenant with Israel for seven years. Okay, that never happened. So this next verse, pay attention to it closely. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until complete destruction. So the city is completely destroyed. One that is decreed, one that is decreed, is poured out on that one who makes desolate. Okay, let's read that. Even until complete destruction, one that is decreed 
is poured out on the one that makes desolate. So God is going to pour out destruction on the one who makes desolate. That's going to happen. And so whoever this is, is going to be judged for doing it. So in the middle of the week, three and a half years into it, in order to do that, he would have to defile the temple. All right. So some people are like, well, is there going to be a third temple? And do we have any evidence of that? We know we had a first temple that was built by King Solomon, and it was a grand, beautiful temple. Then we had the second temple built. You know, famously, when the Jews came back to Israel after the 70 years of captivity, when they built the foundation, there was the sound of weeping and rejoicing all at once because the people who remembered how great the old temple was were weeping to see how small and insignificant this new foundation seemed. But the new crowd that had never seen a temple at all were rejoicing because this is the first of any temple they had ever seen. And so they built the second temple and it was revised for years. And later, uh, Herod had put tons of money into the temple and built it. It just as it says here with the moat and with, you know, everything that is described. But what's interesting is, is that second temple was described and you can go look this up. I won't read it all. Trust me, I'm not going to read all this. We don't have time for that. You can read it all in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 40, verses uh, uh, chapter 40 through chapter 43. And he, in it, he begins to describe measuring out the temple and measuring out all the aspects of the temple, of the second temple that's coming. Pay attention to the fact that this temple in this design didn't happen for many years after the Jews got back to Jerusalem. They built it in stages, but it ended up being exactly as he has uh, described it. And this temple, so important, I'm not going to get into the prophetic uh, symbology of the temple. There is so much to it. It's so deep, so rich. But this temple has an outer wall around it. And famously today, we still have the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, which the Jews believe to be the Western Wall of the Old Temple Mount, which it very well may be. But in stark contrast to Ezekiel 40, chapters 40 through 43, is Revelation chapter 11. And there's just a quick spot in Revelation chapter 11. And this is John, not Ezekiel, seeing this. And John. In uh, Ezekiel chapter, or Ezekiel, Revelation chapter 11 describes measuring out another temple. And in this one, it does not have, it says, leave out the, the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months, three and a half years. That did not happen with Titus, with Antiochus, Epiphanes. It didn't happen with anybody else. This is a unique time. And right after that, it explains the two witnesses that will come and the unique events that will happen with them. So it is not the same temple. And there are many other events, uh, instances, and many other things I could go into. I'm not going to get all into it, but there will be a third temple built in Israel, and it's going to come on the heels of a, an agreement that the Antichrist will make with Israel. And the, uh, obviously the, the covenant is going to be made for peace with Israel and other nations. Uh, it will be a popular one when Trump, actually, uh, I believe he made an agreement, the Abraham Accord with four Islamic nations, four Muslim nations, and Israel and many other things were a part of that Islamic uh, cov uh, accord or an Abrahamic covenant, excuse me, which is supposed to be a covenant between Christians, Jews, and uh, Islam. And they've even made uh, an Islamic or a, a Abrahamic uh, uh, three buildings. I believe it's, I believe it's in Saudi Arabia, maybe UAE, where they have a, a, uh, a Jewish synagogue, a, uh, a, a, you know, a Christian church of some kind, and a mosque, and all three of them being, you know, kind of for the nations, if you will. But for some reason, that covenant wasn't popular. The covenant with the Antichrist will be very popular, and it will be for seven years. It'll be a seven-year agreement, and in this agreement, apparently, it looks like Israel will be honored by saying, hey, look, 
Jerusalem is your capital, go ahead and build your, your temple. Because to the Jews, without a temple, there is no Israel really. They, without their temple, they don't want per se a capital building like we have in Washington, D.C. and many other nations have. They want that temple. That is the sign to their nation that they really are Israel again. And it says that in the middle of the week, he is going to cut off the sacrifice. We're going to get into this because it gets, um, the, I want to share one description of it right here in 2 Thessalonians. And this description gives us more timeline. It gives us timeline into this because this abomination of desolation is the center of this timeline between the tribulation and the great tribulation. I believe we're seeing the, the tribulation cooking up right now. For the rest of the world, it's already been going on for a lot of years. Uh, China and Russia, many other nations, North Korea certainly, but slowly it's encroaching over Europe, it's encroaching into the United States, and soon it will be all over the whole world. Now, some people say, and I'm just going to say this quickly, that in the book of Daniel, it only talks about the four nations, you know, in, in Daniel 7, which would be Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, and then Rome. So that's it. Rome was the empire. But remember Daniel chapter 2, where he saw the stat, the king had the dream of the statue, and Daniel interpreted it. And the nations were Babylon, Persia, Greece. Keep in mind, he was prophesying this all ahead of time. Babylon was the only going nation at the time. That Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome would be nations that would rule the world. But Rome would give way to the feet of iron and clay. Iron is Rome, but it's mixed with clay. These are these other nations, and those represent the, the um, barbarian nations. That, that Rome eventually gave way to. They were never totally defeated. They just kind of melded into this, uh, these nations. Ten nations, ten original nations, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Astrogoths, the, the um, Arians, the, you know, you name the nations. Now, it's not right on my head right now, but the ten nations that eventually took. And then with, um, in the time of Charles the Great or Charlemagne, he, with along with the Pope, joined all those nations together in what was called the Holy Roman Empire. And that's when we start seeing the cross on all of Europe's flags and on their uniforms and on their shields, right? And those nations becoming, quote, Christian nations as Rome, as uh, Europe became the Holy Roman Empire. And that was the fifth one at the feet. And it's in the time of the Holy Roman Empire during its time that we will see these things right and of course america united states being the farthest extension and i believe there's a clue about that in daniel 7 when we see the wings of the eagle breaking away from the lion i believe there's a duality and and, and sometimes a multiplicity of those animals throughout the ages and who they represent but that's another day and another time so basically what i'm saying is is that Rome was not the last revelation or rise of an antichrist. There And man, there's a lot I want to say, but again, let's stick to the point. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this is a very, very key um, portion of scripture when it comes to timing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now keep in mind the chronology of what's being said here. As Paul is writing this letter to the Thessalonians. And there's a little snippet in here when he says uh, a message or a letter as if from us. Okay, that's because some people at the time were trying to be apostles or, or rewrite doctrine. So they would try to write letters as if from Paul to churches to get them to follow what they wanted them to follow so that the church would come into agreement with their doctrines, right? There was a lot going on in this day and age. So when I come to that, you'll know what that means. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. Right? Even look at how that sentence is constructed. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. That you not be quickly shaken from your composure 
or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. Okay, I added the word already, but that's what it means, that the day of the Lord has come, that it's already come. Jesus has already come. Okay, and this is Paul at a very late time in his, uh, in his ministry, right? Still, 70 AD had not happened. Still, the city had not been destroyed, but it was close. Then he says this, let no one in any way deceive you. Remember Matthew 24, Jesus begins by saying, let no, nobody deceive you. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. What will not come? With regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, is revealed the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. So the Antichrist is going to display himself in the temple as God. And this most likely is when he's going to cut off the sacrifice and the grain offering and all that. He's going to say, that's it. You're done. The Messiah is here and I am him. And he is going to stand in the holy place. As it says in Matthew 24, let the reader understand he's going to stand in the holy place and declare himself to be the Messiah. He's going to say he is God on earth. And it's significant that he will do it to the Jews because that's where the Messiah is supposed to be revealed. And he wants the world to believe that he is the Messiah, the son of God, so that they will follow God. And we all know who his God is, and it's not our God. All right. His God is the dragon, that evil dragon of old. It's important to note, and I'm not going to get all into this, but when you read about the Antichrist, especially in Daniel, the little horn that comes up among the ten horns and uproots three of them. The ten horns were up first. He didn't come along till later. So the ten kings will be given power by him, but he's not really going to be recognized till later in the game. I believe that the way that will go, that the Antichrist will raise up ten kings or leaders of ten allotted areas on the earth, ten nations, if you will, that they're going to identify as nations in their world. And that it won't be until later that he will rise up. And when he does, he will displace three nations upon his rising up. And I believe the sign of his rising up will be this event where he declares himself to be the son of God. So, and there's so many other things that run in conjunction to this. And again, I'm going to stick to the point. So we're not going to run off on him. But that gives timeline. It lets us know something. So how can we be sure that Matthew 24 fits in our timeline and not the past or way off in the far future? So we're going to look at that next week, right? Matthew 24, verse 32, uh, and that begins there. I'm going to turn back to Matthew right now and just say a couple more things about it. And then we'll uh, go on to some questions. And I don't even know how far, how far are we at? Feels like, oh, we've gone on quite a bit. So, wow. Time flies when you're having fun. So get back to Matthew 24, because next week we're going to go further into answering timeline. And I want to keep it simple. I want to keep it easy, but I want to keep it to the point. So Matthew 24, starting at 32, um, is going to combine together. And I'll tell you now, if you want to get this, this week, go and read Matthew chapter 21, through 23. And we're going to put together a timeline that's going to show you when in history, the season, if you will, when the last days will take place and the end times will come to pass. So um, with that, I'm going to open this up and ask if anybody has any questions about what we've read, please have questions. <laughs> and just feel free to unmute yourself and jump in and yeah, I'm excited to answer a question or two or three. Don't everybody talk at once. Hey, Daniel, thank you so much. 
I'm totally enjoying these teachings. Oh, good. <laughs> um, there's so much meat that you're sharing. I just, I have to dissect it before I can even come up with any questions. So right now I'm just kind of absorbing and I just wanted to let you know, that's why I don't have any questions right now. Well, I'll share something with you. I think this is fun that you might enjoy. So Matthew chapter 10, and this will sound like I'm going off a little bit, but I'm not. Matthew chapter 10 if you'll, uh, in Matthew chapter 10, it begins, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness, right? Then the very next verse, now the names of the 12 apostles are these. So upon receiving authority from Jesus, they became apostles. They were no longer disciples. So isn't it interesting that in Matthew 24, when it begins, because he's late in his ministry, he's almost on the cross at this point. It says, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to them. And then they said, do you see, not see all these things and all these stones? And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately. I really look at that part to, to me to say that he's speaking to disciples right here, not just apostles. He's speaking to all of us. He, and he's not just speaking to. Um, we're still going. We're still going. Yeah. Um, did did we uh, have more questions? No, sorry, Dan. I didn't realize I wasn't still muted. It's Vernus. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let me throw in another timeline thing that I think that's really important because when the city's destroyed, there are two things that are going to happen. And this week, I want you all just to go read this. Write this down. Oh man, I wish I could teach. Oh endlessly endlessly this beautiful book of zechariah that was written zechariah chapter 14 describes the day that it happens when it says you know when those who are on the rooftops get down off the rooftops and run 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 it describes what's going to happen jesus is going to come back in in a way of he's going to set up his coming by ripping the Mount of Olives in half from north to south, opening up to give the Jews a way of escape. And they're going to escape at this very event where the Antichrist does this. Okay, so write this down and read this. So very important. Also, for those people that you'll read to the end of Zechariah 14, you'll be like, man, there's going to be nations still outside the holy city. Yeah, read Revelation 20, and it'll tell you about them. And then eventually Satan will lead an uprising when he's led out for a short time. There, I gave you a little blip of something. But look at this in uh, Revelation 12, at the end of Revelation 12, for some timeline here. And I'm just throwing this in for free. Part of, man, I, when the Holy Ghost is on me like this, y'all, I don't know that I can sleep. But um, there's going to be a big war. The dragon is going to come against the church and try to destroy the, church, the, the Jews first. But look at this thing that happens when the Jews escape. Because some people say this is just going to happen to the Jews. Really, let's look at this. Revelation 12, verse 13. And the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, and he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Okay, I won't go all into it, but the woman is Israel, as described in verse 1. We, we described that last week, actually, here in Revelation 12. So I'm glad we did that for this purpose. The dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, so he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years in prophetic speak, folks. From the presence of the serpent. So she got away from the serpent. And the serpent poured out water like a river from his mouth after the woman, so he might cause her to be swept away with a flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river, which the dragon poured out of his mouth. Okay, so God opens up the ground. I believe that's when the mountains torn in half, and that's going to help that. And then it'll describe that in, oh, I got to slow down. Here's the key verse that shows us that it's not just Israel. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's us. Okay. And that's that three and a half years of the great tribulation. And we're going to look at that timeline more. And next week will be more defining the great tribulation and then that timeline. 
and what events happen in it. So we've still got some time. Does anybody have a question? Anything just random, throw it in there, please. I have one. Okay, what's up? Oh, I'm the Usher Wing. So um, it's talking about false signs and wonders, but it looks like that doesn't happen until after the abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a So I'm looking at 2415. Yep. And then um, 2424. Right. So yeah, before the, the, during the great tribulation and everything, so those kinds of, and when I say false signs and wonders, what are we talking about, about false signs and wonders? Because we know today people do false signs and wonders trying to draw spiritual attention to themselves. So what do we mean? These are specific false signs and wonders. So there are certain signs in the Bible, man, how can I do this without getting too crazy? There are certain signs that show you things. Uh, I'll share with you a couple of hidden ones, but first let me show you one hidden sign that show, that's a good sign. Well, a good sign in a bad moment. So when Jesus was born, and this is shocking to a lot of Christians, the, the three wise men were not at the manger, folks. They didn't show up until Jesus was two years old, okay? So when they showed up following the star, they were asking Herod, the king, bad guy to go to concerning where he was. And so when Herod found out that that king of the Jews might be out there that could take his place, he went out to kill him. And from the time given of those guys, he said, kill every Jewish baby boy, two years old and under. So an angel came to, to Joseph, Jesus's father and said, get into Egypt. And so he took the baby into Egypt. And then later the angel said, okay, those who were after the child are gone. They're dead. Go back into Israel and you know I'll show you where to go and your baby's safe now okay that's actually a sign a prophetic sign because Jesus wore every title every title that anybody in the Old Testament ever wore so one of those titles was a deliverer and the sign of it was when Moses a baby boy the great ruler of the nation feared the Jews and so wanted to kill every baby boy two years old and under and so they were on, the Jews were on the Goshen side of the Nile River. The Egypt was on the west side or the Egypt side. They were on the slave side and they would do all their work over there. So the baby was let go in the Nile River and made it across and over to the temple where he was taken in by the royal family and grew up there. He crossed over into Egypt and came back and was a deliverer to the people. It's a sign. So there are certain signs. Well, there are false signs and false wonders. What are false signs and wonders? What like wonders? Like when Elijah set up the altar with the false prophets of Baal who set up an altar. And he said, okay, let's see your false God prove himself to be true. If your false God is true, he'll make fire come down from heaven. And then he taunted him saying, isn't your God on the toilet? Where is he? What's up with your God? But then our God made fire come from heaven and consumed the offering on the altar that Elijah had put and covered with a lot of water. And this sign showed that God was with him, and eventually the false prophets of Baal were killed for this. Well, the Bible says that the false prophet will cause even fire to come from heaven. To the Jews, nobody would do this unless they were from God. So he's going to show false signs and wonders that are certain signs in Scripture that, that make it look like these false prophets, like they're from God. Anybody else? We got like one minute. So I have a question. Uh, Revolution, Revelation 12, we're talking about the dragons going off to make war um, and the two wings of an eagle basically allow Israel to escape. Then the dragon is going to go off and make war with Israel's other children. Mm -hmm. What what verses are, the, are we at? I don't, I'm not at that part of my Bible. What verses is that cited? Okay. That's Revelation 12, 17. 17. Okay, thank you. And it says, so the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God 
and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So her other children, that's us, all of the nation, uh, you know, all the Christian believers. Now, that does not mean that the Christians aren't already going to be going through uh, tribulation and, you know, and all of this. But these particular Jews that escape, it may be, this may be, and I, man, I'm studying, I'm learning. This may be the 144,000 that escape right here, mm. uh, the 12 from each tribe, uh, you know, uh, 12,000 from each tribe. And so, um, and I'm not totally sure, but I know that the great tribulation that's coming, that that time period, and we're going to go over that next week. What happens inside that time period? What things define it? Uh, where is the church in that time period and all that? We're going to do that next week. But yes, this verse here makes it very clear that the word given in uh in Matthew 24 is not just at Jerusalem and Israel. So Dan, it's respectful of everyone's time. This is Vern. Uh, it's 801. And um, so we look forward to next week. Okay. And, and you're gonna post this recording like you posted the uh, first one? Um, I am. Uh, let me, participants, get rid of those. I'm going to post this recording. In fact, uh, I will, um, I'll put it up on, uh, you know, I'll send you a copy, of course, in, in emails, and then I'll post yeah. it in uh, Facebook and start, you know, getting copies of this out there. And uh, yeah, so definitely everybody read the scriptures that we were talking about for next week, come in here. And I mean, this is going to get crazy. Right now, we're just kind of baby stepping it in. And this is going to be fun. So great. Thanks so much, Dan. We'll see you next week. Okay, you, we'll Dan. see you all next week. Thank you for being here.